that drawing by DeCamp, I noticed was squared off. I assume so that it could be transferred to the canvas for final painting. Is that a typical approach for him? Did the other founding Boston School painters use this approach? I believe you mentioned that you don't typically start with a drawing for the sake of efficiency. What, uh, would you say that starting with the drawing and transferring to the canvas for painting is helpful or a hindrance? Um, huh. Yeah, that's a, that's a good one. I mean, I, I'm saying huh because I'm thinking of all these possible, there's different things that it brings up. Um, now, first of all, uh, there's nothing good, bad, or indifferent about doing a preliminary drawing and transferring information to a canvas. There's nothing in my mind difficult or problematical about uh, what, for example, Brackman used to do, just take some charcoal and mark some key locations, you know, set up what some people like to refer to as the arabesque of the elements on the canvas uh, or of the whatever it is you're painting. And, um, you know, sort of organize a little bit. And then he, Brackman would just take it, throw some charcoal around a little bit, and then he would just dust it all off and then start painting the, by the spots in an impressionist way. But doing that, uh, what we did with Gamel to differentiate, and what was f far more characteristic, and certainly of Ang, uh, you also see with Jerome and many other people who are doing uh, drawings for imaginative work, where they're doing uh, studies of the model, taking a pose, you know, and doing whatever that is, uh, of, of whatever that subject, you know, figure, um, uh, an animal, a building, whatever, and then gridding it up so that, was, uh, you know, and, 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 and using that as a speedier transfer method. Um, all those things are fine. I'm, I'm not even sure, I mean, I don't know enough about cameras to even say that. I'm not even sure that um, having shot a photograph, taken a photograph like that, you wouldn't be just as well served to uh, project it, that photograph. Uh, but the projective stuff I've seen really does deform and distort. I've used it uh, in some minor mural work. I've used the uh, overhead projectors to project stuff, and it's just remarkable. You know, the older ones were remarkably bad. Uh, but yet today, there's some possibilities uh, you know, with the new kinds of, um, you know, the taking a photograph, say of a drawing, and then using one of the projectors that we now use um, to... Um, uh, to do presentations and that sort of thing, and, 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 and then tracing it literally up there. There's not, I can't imagine any problem with any of that stuff. But it's, it's, really, it's really the, in the, in the, in the domain of uh, imaginative painting that you think of the, using that sort of thing. Um, primarily, you know, I say primarily, I, don't, I frankly don't care what people do <laughs> as far, but I will tell you what some of the limitations are in my in relation to what I my goals are, and that's where the big differences are. You know what your goals are is what determines uh, how you must work. For example, when I say aesthetic goals, visual goals, uh, storytelling, whatever they happen to be, whatever they dominate. So I don't have any interest in uh, limiting people. But when we were students with Gamel, we would do drawings, and I'm going to try to show you one. I'm hoping I can do that because I just got a copy of it from the owner, uh, just a preliminary drawing that was then traced up and then the picture was painted. And it was the first major sale I'd ever had in my life. It was a ridiculous amount of money for me as a young student. And, um, and it was really thanks, of course, to Gamel uh, making a connection for me, knowing the need, you know, which is really one of those things that Gamel was, uh, you know, underrated, shall we say, for, at least in my mind. I don't know, I'm not sure he ever fully knew how much I appreciated what he did in those sorts of ways. But he took it upon himself to rather try to help you make some connections that way and uh, or to make a little income. So that drawing is going to be here. It's a, it's a full, careful drawing. What we then did is we laid tracing paper over it. By the way, it's a drawing on brown paper, just so you know. And, um, and then we laid tracing paper over it and traced the main lines of it. And then we just uh, charcoaled the back of that paper. Um, and 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 pushed through that those the um, uh, laid it on a canvas and then just pushed hard against the tr traced portions just ran over them again pushing on them until they took a made a mark on the canvas and then we either increased those marks or just started painting I increased them you know went over them again to make sure they're strong enough to see um, but it, what we did and so in fact what we were doing was doing exactly what a um, what an imaginative painter would do. Um, now, let's let us let us discuss the 
problem or the issue that really this sets up. I mean, first of all, an Impressionist is painting with everything at once. If you read Hale's book, and I would love to tell you what page, one of these days I'm going to have to write it down or memorize the page, but he's got an entire page, maybe a page and a half, in which he describes um, how drawing is everything. And he doesn't mean what you, if you're an academic, think that means, that drawing is everything, nothing else matters. He means that drawing is color and chroma and all those things. And he's talking about Vermeer, and he says Vermeer understood this that everything relates to everything. And so there's this thing in the way of thinking of the Boston School that is characteristic of, of Impressionism, and that is that you're always talking about the, the, all the horses at once. You're always talking about the, the elements all sitting before you at the same time. And so to having done it, some sort of really nice drawing doesn't benefit you. In fact, it inhibits you. Because you don't want to be wrecking any of that happy drawing you put down there, you know. And so what I'm doing, what I'm doing now in in the process, I find way more useful than anything else I'd ever done, is I set down color notes first and just let them distribute themselves around in a hunt for a little bit of their location, you know, something about their location, but mostly for their color values and their and and the search for the color scheme as a pure unity mindset, abstraction, you know what I mean? So I do color first. So what is the value for me of having drawing there? Well, you could argue that the value would be that I know where to put those spots, and that's fair enough. I'm not, I don't, and I don't, dis, I don't uh, tell students they mustn't do that either. But what I found is that you start believing in yesterday's drawing, and that I think is probably the most problematical thing, because when you do a drawing that's just black and white, it's, it's amazing how much you miss when you're doing a drawing in color, in full color from the beginning. So, and you can't you can't explain that to somebody. You have to have lived it. So, uh, but that's the reason I do what I do, though. And this, and, or and part of that, though, the, the reason I go for color first, though, is because color is kind of like a, in a funny way. You know, you think of drawing as being this prima donna, but in a sense, color is. Color doesn't even want to walk around it. It pretends that you know, if you're going to talk about drawing, I'm not in the room, and that's actually what you'll find. The draw, color does not want to be there. If you're busy doing drawing, your brain is not even w capable of addressing it. Ang talks about this. I really do recommend you do look at, if you don't have a copy of it, ask me for it. I've done a translation, had a translation done from the French. But in the, in the very first set of quotes, he's, Ang says, you can't do drawing and my kind of, I'm sorry, my kind of drawing and articulating a form and color at the same time. And he's saying that color is demanding a different forum. It's demanding to be handled in a different, you know, I think he's talking about like it's floating and it has its own necessities that separate you from his way of drawing. And I don't want to say any more about that. I'll send you the quote if somebody wants it. In fact, I'll try to stick it online in the comment section if somebody asks me. But he's very clear in his own mind that you ain't doing... Um, uh, his kind of work, and not have and have a mindset of being all over the place at once, with every other thing. And I mean, not all the place at once, but all the horses at once. It's very clear in his mind. It's so much so, and by the way, that even Degas would say the drawing is what happens between the contours. Well, that's all sweet and good, except the problem is, the drawing is way more than that. The drawing is not just what happens on an object. Drawing is what happens in space. It's the distance between objects front to back and all, and even between elements of, in a drawing, you know, just between, between the, um, the, the person's head over here and this other person's head over here, that's drawing. That placement is drawing. Uh, size relationships of those things, this is all drawing. This is all the function of the spatial, which is the drawing part. So, um, I'm just get that, get that back again. So, um, yeah, <laughs> bearing myself in my work here. Um, so I believe you mentioned I typically start with the drawing for the sake of efficiency. Or I don't start with the drawing for efficiencies. No, so if you just say it's helpful or not helpful, that's my point there. It's helpful if you're doing some kinds of work. It's not helpful if you're doing others, but I don't have a problem with people. It's a, it's seri it's a serious piece of focus it requires to do work without drawing in the beginning. It really takes patience, and you have to not get, not get uh, worried. You have to somehow manage to keep yourself distant and just watch and watch. And, uh, and then you begin to bring in the first bit of drawing and you maintain patience again and now you've incorporated color, not just color placement and color relationships producing a color scheme, but now 
drawing, meaning actually the articulation of a silhouette with an improved now light effect, with an actual edge, with the look of nature at a spot. And you're now in a place where you've opened the world up to the rest of the story. And, uh, uh, and then you begin to be this eyeball. And I'm just ru- saying what runs always through my head. You begin to just watch your canvas evolve. You watch the stuff to come up out of the fog. You know, you're working with these primary elements, and you're anchoring them, and you're and you're relating them, and you're and you're searching. You're trying to get these three or four or five early things, much like getting the color players to suggest the color scheme. You're trying to get these three or four or five early things to actually suggest the entire gesture and and uh, and form and all those other things of the uh, of the uh, of the total ensemble. But yeah, so because I'm working on that, um, and I know it's just watching the canvas, watching the canvas, watching the canvas. I said to you, I think it's all last week, I said, or last time we spoke, I, I think I said, you know, Gamble at one point said to a student that one, somebody wanted to study with him, he, and I quoted him that time, I said, he, he said, he said, this guy thinks with his ears what people have told him. And he sees, I'm sorry, he sees with his ears what people have told him. Well you will find yourself in that place. You have to, I found that students have to keep out of their ears, not out of their, they have to keep all their thoughts right out here, watching this, watching that, watching the play of things before them, right? And if it's a package, if it's a total ensemble and you're doing all, everything at once in the Boston School way, you won't want to have one aspect of it finished. The reason, by the way, that I can justify painting color first is because all you're doing is wetting the canvas. You just see what I'm saying? So you're then going to be able to paint wet into wet, but then you'll know what the notes are because you've actually assessed them, and you can see that the color scheme is there, and now you can begin to bring the drawing out of wet color, okay? And that, that process is one that happens a little more f- rapidly uh, in a, with a um, Boston School painter, and more completely, I'm talking about the assessment of the articulation. I'm sorry, not the assessment, but the assessment of the form and the articulation of it, of, an, of a silhouette. There's a key silhouette that's strong versus another one. So... Man, I'm not sure I've done anything except mince me to that one, but um, but I, but that really is pretty fundamental. Um, and it, and the other question was, is it typical? And I don't see any evidence of it being typical for him or Velasquez or anybody else. Otherwise, we'd have more of those drawings. We don't have very many. Um, Paxton is. Um, I, I found a number of drawings by Paxton of portrait portrait drawings. Uh, in which he, I think the Coolidge one is one of them, where he's clearly done a drawing, probably one that didn't take more than a day or two. I said sitting or two. And, uh, and then he's traced it up. I mean, he's gridded it up just exactly as Nang would do and transferred it. Uh, but that's, you know, that, that's a world where you find yourself limited to the, to the uh, sitter's time, you know, and that sort of thing, you know. And uh, instead of you can, working from photographs, you know, you, you ask the sitter for time and do drawings. And... Uh, but it's enormously limiting from the point of view of what I'm talking about, the searching out the full color scheme simultaneously, you know, and letting yourself just go through the music, of, you know, and all the different uh, categories, all the different uh, aspects that it has. Uh, so, yeah, it's really the best I can do with that. Um, uh, but I think that's, I think that's uh, as clear an answer as I can give, yeah. Yeah. Others of them, yeah, yeah. You, all of them did grid from time to time, but you know, the murals of uh, some, you know, of, uh, what's his name of uh, uh, Benson, <coughs> the Library of Congress. I believe I've seen at least one gridded drawing for one of those. So, yeah, so yeah, but for different reasons, different times, different reasons. But the impressionist painter painting from life on the spot, it just doesn't have a great deal of value. The one by we talked about at the very beginning. You talked about the blue cup. Um, Look at how different the drawing is at the end from the uh, this, the, pa- the the drawing in the painting is from the drawing in the drawing. He didn't stick to it at all. It was just really a, a largely just there to get sort of the general statement up on the canvas uh, for some sort of efficiencies, uh, you know, efficiency, time-wise efficiencies. But uh, by the time you get to the, you know, by the time you know, you see where he's gotten to in that painting. All these relationships there are so so beautiful. The, the, you know, the this to this and that to that of it is, it's a real song. And uh, uh, so he, whatever he did, he, you know, wasn't a slave to it, wasn't, 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 and by the way, people who trace drawings aren't necessarily slaves to them, but I tell you what, when we were students of Gamel, it was a lot, it was a lot more difficult to make adjustments to drawings he'd already fixed in stone rather on the canvas. 
Usually, big, the, re, the big reason being because there'd be too many other relationships that'd be off if you change one little thing, and uh, that was the sort of stuff because partially was happening because you're just a young student. Uh, but also, it just happens because there are so many relationships that affect so many other, so many elements that affect so many other things relationally, that um, you really want to be all over the place. It's again, read, find the Vermeer book, and and get yourself into that section where he describes the the the, the whole the holistic. Uh, view of, uh, of drawing, and you'll see why I would say what I'm saying. So, all right, thank you. Comment, um, uh, like, share, and, um, and subscribe, please. Uh, appreciate all that you have done so, so far. Um, your numbers are going up nicely, and uh, it's much appreciated. It's also been expressed by any number of people, I mean a lot of people, that they're really exp and getting a benefit. So um, it's my sincere hope that that is exactly what's happening. Uh, this stuff isn't mine, it isn't, you know, it's all, it's, the, to the extent that it's real useful knowledge, even to the extent that it's just my experience, uh, I know it can elevate you, you know. I love that idea of, I think it was Isaac Newton, he was saying, you know, don't put me up too much on a pedestal, it's not that I'm so great, I'm standing on the shoulders of giants. But each of us are in the next generation, in the next iteration, you know, uh, in the next evolution, are just simply there because of what we've, we've been able to, to uh, grasp and, and build on from people before us. And I'm just playing a role in the middleman role that you all, I hope, will play as in your time. Anyway, thank you very much. Next time.